Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar entitled Nurses of the Pacific, the Jen Ken Jane Kendi story. <laughs> My name is Lauren. I'm the adult programs coordinator here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. Uh, before we get started with our presentation, I want to introduce Glenn from the Veterans Breakfast Club uh, to speak a little bit about their amazing programs and uh, to thank them again for connecting us with our wonderful presenter today, who is Stephen McLeod. Okay. Thanks very much, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so yeah, I've got the really sort of easy job here, and that's uh, telling you a little bit about our organization and introducing Steve. Uh, Veterans Breakfast Club is a nonprofit based in Pittsburgh, been around 17, 18 years, formally organized 15 years ago. We just celebrated our 15th anniversary, uh, started by a man named Todd DePastino, who are still our executive director. He's a Yale-educated PhD historian. And uh, as the title uh, uh, shows you, we are all about uh, veteran storytelling. Uh, and the reason it got the Breakfast Club in it and is, that, is that's how Todd started it 17, 18 years ago, having breakfast back then with some World War II veterans. Uh, he kept gathering more and more of them together over breakfast. Pretty soon their family members were coming to breakfast. Pretty soon he was having breakfast with 50, 60 people mixture of veterans from World War II and eventually Vietnam, uh, and a lot of family members and loved ones. And what he sort of brought out was that these veterans were more than willing to tell their story in front of other veterans, but then mixing in the civilians helped the civilians to uh, appreciate what those veterans had done for us. Um, the, the, the organization has grown. Uh, I'm a board member now. Uh, with the advent of the of COVID, we couldn't have so many breakfasts. Those are in-person meetings, and they're only in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, now we do internet-based programming and the in-person events. And the neat thing about the internet is that it's worldwide, and we've been able to uh, have guests on from lots and lots of different places. These are a couple of the vets talking at one of the breakfasts. Uh, that might be Todd in the red hat. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, we still hold breakfast, mostly during the spring and summer months. And then my role, besides being a board member, is I host a weekly program called Greatest Generation Live, and it's everything about World War II. It's vet interviewing veterans, and I had the great privilege to interview 30 or 40 veterans in the past uh, four years that I've been doing this, and interview a lot of authors of World War II books. And um, it's been fascinating for me. And I think we've helped to uh, memorialize some of these stories. Uh, obviously, not too many Vietnam or World War II veterans left. So that part's getting harder and harder. Luckily, we have men like Steve McLeod, who is the author of this book that he's going to touch on today, Black Dragon. We uh, were introduced to Steve a year plus ago. We had him on last February sort of celebrating the anniversary of uh, the Battle of Iwo Jima. As you can tell, it's well noted, well annotated, well read. And I highly recommend this book to anybody who's interested in the Pacific War and the Marine Corps specifically. It really is, in my mind, sort of the band of brothers of the Pacific. Uh, but Steve did a great job for us a year ago. And then I can't remember quite where the connection with Lauren came in, but when Lauren and I were talking and she was talking about this program that we're going to uh, put on today, I said, well, you need to talk to uh, Steve McLeod. He's written an excellent book and there's an incredible story in here about this nurse named Jane. Uh, I'm sorry, am I getting the name wrong? Jane? Kendi. Kendi, jeez. Kendi, yeah. And here is Steve. And I'm just going to turn this over to Steve and just melt away in the background and just relax and listen to this story. It's a great story. And, and one last plug, if you'd like to uh, see any of our programming, just Google Veterans Breakfast Club and our website comes up and you can enter through that uh, website to any of our programming. One last plug, as of late, we've been focusing on every Thursday night, Masters of the Air, the TV series is on Apple TV. Every Thursday night, we do sort of a critical comment part of the previous episode. And I have an aviation expert for some aspect of the European Air War on. And I have a couple of veterans. I have three or four veterans from the Air War that join us every Thursday night. No further ado, it is Steve's turn. Steve, I'm really nice to see you again. Hey, thanks, Glenn. Great to see you. Appreciate that. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, it's great to be here, and it's uh, great to be talking about Jane. 
certainly. And, you know, I was telling someone yesterday, this is sort of unofficially the Jane Kennedy week, because just a few days ago, uh, my article came uh, out in Leatherneck magazine, the magazine, the Marine Corps, um, featuring Jane and that famous photograph uh, from Iwo Jima when she was photographed comforting uh, one of the Marines in the book on which I um, covered, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marines. And that's Sergeant Bill Wyckoff, who's on the stretcher there. And that's the morning of the 6th of March, 1945. And um, so there's um, a fun story to tell. And uh, certainly that's the connection to the book. And um, so what I thought we would do is uh, hit the high spots since we, we, you know, we don't have a lot of time to take a deep dive, if you will, uh, into the operations necessarily of the squadron that she was a part of. But I think we can do a pretty fair job of, uh, of, uh, like I say, hitting the high parts, uh, high spots, and and uh, capturing some of the tidbits that are of great interest. Uh, so it's great to tell this story. That's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit today, if I can, about um, the the setup, how these two people came to uh, encounter each other on Iwo Jima, what led up to that, and what was going on that day uh, that influenced both of them. A little surprise for you uh, as we get toward the end of that story as well. So. Well, let's move on if, I, if we can. Now, Jane had, uh, well, she was from Ohio, and there's a little bit of debate in wartime newspapers. She was written up by the correspondents as being from Oberlin, Ohio, and the newspapers in Henrietta, Ohio, said that's not the case. She's from Henrietta. Well, she was a class of 1940 graduate of Henrietta High School and, um, and completed her nurse's training at St. Luke's in uh, Cleveland, as a matter of fact, in uh, June of 1943. So she, uh, pictured there, uh, had some experience as a nurse uh, by the time the Navy decided to really, I think it's proper to say, take a cue from the Army and set up um, an air evacuation or flight nurse school, I should say, really, in Alameda, California. And Jane was one of the first 12 selected uh, for that school. And um, there's been some uh, some detail written on the school. I'm not a scholar of that program, unfortunately. Um, I, I understand that it was eight weeks in duration and, uh, and quite detailed. In th the uh, characteristics uh, of flight uh, nursing, there are a lot of dynamics at altitude that come into play. Um, you've got to be careful who you select, what kind of wounds can be uh, taken up to altitude, um, those types of things. And then there's specialized training. Uh, if you're flying, in this case, from Iwo Jima to Guam, which is something over five hours in the air, uh, they were they were trained to recognize such things as the early onset of shock, a delayed shock, or the the onset of um, delayed hemorrhaging, things of those uh, of that nature, um, and therefore to prepared on the planes to give infusions as necessary of albumin, uh, whole blood, etc. So there was a lot of training they went through, including uh, what happens if you've got to ditch uh, at sea, uh, prepare the wounded on that uh, aircraft. Uh, how are you going to get them out there? And some has been written, uh, for example, of uh, one of their requirements was to pull a, a casualty, if you will, a person, some 440 yards in the water in under 10 minutes. Now, that staggers my mind uh, to think that you'd have to do that, but um, it was one of the requirements that they had to go through. So Jane had some experience before she ended up uh, in that nursing program, flight nurse program, and before she sailed to the Pacific. Now, the other side of the story I want to introduce you to is Sergeant Wyckoff from, as I said, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 23rd. Uh, the rifle company that's featured in the book Black Dragon, and uh, we follow them across the Pacific. That's Bill in the front row, kneeling second from right, uh, sort of up front, and uh, a big personality. And he did have a big personality, uh, suitably. But um, that company is one of the assault rifle companies that hit Iwo Jima on D-Day on the 19th of February, uh, 1945. And by the time the squadron of um, uh, flight nurses began its operations, I mean, you're talking a distance, a, a time span from 19 February to 6 March. It took them that long. They had to wait on Guam 
for the word that an airfield was secure enough to begin operations. And that morning turned into the 6th of March. By that time, the 3rd, 4th Marine Divisions were now pressing up into the northern part of Iwo Jima. If you think Iwo Jima looks like a pork chop there, then they're headed into the meaty section. And, um, and in fact, just one photograph uh, that might give us some sense of what it looked like up there and the nature of that battlefield, this is it. This is a pretty good one. Uh, there was not enough space in the rocky terrain to even get more than three or four or five guys together at any one time. So it began, um, it, it was very chaotic. So the 6th of March was a pretty good day for the flight evacuations to begin to support the, op the operations that had already begun. Uh, up to that time, the evacuations had been handled mostly by troop ships, troop transports, and the two hospital ships that were working back and forth in tandem, uh, moving between Iwo Jima and first Saipan and then Guam. So that's an interesting two-week period during which uh, the squadron was waiting for the word on Guam. This photograph was taken on Guam, and there's Jane in the background in the polka dots, and um, the five of the other nurses. The one on the right is the boss, the chief nurse, Lieutenant J.G. Emily Purvis. And uh, in fact, I see Jean Dahl, who's second from left as well. And what is uh, purportedly happening here, they're drawing names to see who's going to be first to go to Iwo Jima. Now, for reasons I'll explain in a second, I think that this, this was actually done after the fact for PR purposes. Um, maybe we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But they were, you know, when they arrived on Guam and they moved, let me, let me talk about the squadron just for a second. Her squadron was VE2 or uh, Flight Evacuation Squadron number two. And there were two others that were formed later uh, or doing other things. They were formed at the Naval Air Station Kaneohe on Oahu and began the move to Guam in January. The planes themselves and the crews flew out in January of 45, and the uh, nurses Jane flew out in February. And in fact, she arrived at Guam 79 years ago today, the 21st of February, uh, third day of the Iwo Jima operation. And they arrived when they got to Guam, as they said, no one was really expecting them. So they arrived to a lot of red clay. And in fact, in some of the film footage, I see evidence that uh, members of their own squadron uh, built some of their accommodations, at least some of them. So they started out in tents with cold showers and outdoor latrines surrounded by sheets and that sort of thing. And, and their, uh, their life uh, improved a little bit thereafter. You know, I would mention just a little bit about the nurses there. They, they were under curfew. Now, they are separate from, in a lot of ways, the other nurses on the island as flight nurses. They're under the command, for example, of a naval aviator rather than a medical officer. Uh, Keller was his name. And later, um, Jack Thornburg, I think it was. So uh, they had, uh, they said, a little more flexibility than some others had. But they did have a curfew if they were off duty had to be back uh, by 10 p.m. And if they were out in the evening, they were always accompanied by two officers and one of them had a sidearm. So they were looking after the girls, uh, trying to keep them uh, you know, out of trouble and certainly on alert. Uh, when Jane arrived, the squadron's fleet of 12 aircraft had been grounded on Guam so that they were ready at a moment's notice, in fact, to fly out early the next morning if they got the call. And that's pretty much the way it played out. Now, I thought I would add a couple of images here from Jane's flight log that will be instructive for us. And here is the month of March in her flight log for that matter. And, and up top in the top line, we can see this flight to Iwo Jima finally when she gets the call to do that. Uh, her pilot is Lieutenant John T. Burns flying his uh, R4D, which is the Navy's version of the C-47. And what is fascinating, what was fascinating to me when I first saw this, is that they fly from Agania Airfield on Guam, first to Saipan that morning, and then on to Iwo Jima. And unfortunately, it appears that their operational records, not their diaries and war logs and those, operational records must have been misplaced. So we can't at the moment, find, find out why they stopped at Saipan or exactly who was on that plane 
with Jane. We know most of them, but there's some a couple other folks that we can't identify yet. But uh, here we get to see the actual route that she took to Iwo Jima on the morning of the 6th of March. And when she was on the plane, when she got on that plane that morning, let me set the story up because at the um, National Museum of the Pacific War, uh, in their archives is a scrapbook that was, I would say, uh, donated to them by the photographer, a fellow named Lieutenant Gil DeWitt, part of Edward Steichen's team. DeWitt had been told he was to be on, he's supposed to be at Agana Airfield the morning of the 6th of March for a 2 a.m. flight aboard the plane with Lieutenant Purvis. And he was to document the arrival of the first flight nurse to land in an active combat zone. And uh, uh, as I tell it in the article, Jane Kendi on her plane and the corpsman with her, who was uh, Cy Sturdivant, uh, chief pharmacist mate, are on there when a photographer walks on board with them and explains that he'd gotten there 10 minutes early, but Lieutenant Purvis's plane was already gone. It left early. And so he thought he'd just go along with them anyway and do what he could to document that story. And so he took a few photographs on the plane, including this one of Jane. Now, it, aside from the obvious, you know, okay, she's getting some rest, which they always did on the way up because it's a very long day. There are a few other things we see there. One, look at what she's lying upon, the stack of wool blankets. Those are part of their cargo. They're taking replacements to Iwo Jima because of the cool weather on Iwo and the casualties each required two to three blankets. So supplies were running low very quickly on Iwo Jima. So each of these planes took a replacement uh, cache of uh, blankets. And in the background, you might see a stack of stretchers back there as well, litters to replace those that they're going to bring back with the casualties. Also, they would take um, a cooler. There's a cooler box that I'll show you of whole blood, a replacement whole blood, but they did a modified version that included albumin and some other things that they would use. And right there in front of us is the 70 pound flight medical chest that each of these planes had. Now that one's named to another aircraft. And I wish I knew why, but it's named to an aircraft Jane never flew on, but uh, they took it with them this morning. A lot of stuff in there that she's going to use uh, as well. So a historic shot there. When she did get up, she's opening that flight chest and examining some of the supplies that she's got inside. Uh, to the right is one of the containers of the whole blood. And I would mention very rapidly for us. This system could uh, now the, the, the coolant, I guess the ice and everything had to be replaced every 24 hours. But blood could be um, sustained this way for it was good for up to 21 days. And one of the combat correspondents wrote that uh, folks back home in California could donate blood and four days later, it could be on Iwo Jima. Now this is going to Guam first and that's where the main uh, forward area blood bank was. But now I wanna say that because things start get, getting pretty impressive when we realize just what they were able to accomplish that period of time. Now Jane, when uh, she was flying that morning on Lieutenant Burns' plane, and, when they got there on the 6th of March, they had to, um, they couldn't land. They had to circle the island for 90 minutes. And they were awaiting the largest pre you know, preparatory bombardment of the war, as it happened that morning of the 6th, because that was the be beginning of that second big push to northern Iwo Jima. So they um, arrived finally 90 minutes later. And when they did, there's Lieutenant Purvis, who we can see, and Jane just behind her. And we see them uh, observing a, a casualty who's getting a, an infusion of whole blood. I believe this to be one of the tents of the 3rd Medical Battalion, which belonged to the 3rd Marine Division, but right there on the airfield. And we can get a look, use this photograph to get a look at that area. Um, the flight evacuation tents were there. The thir B Company, 3rd Medical Battalion tents were off to the right. The whole blood bank for the entire island is off to the right. This whole area really is in, in defilade or uh, at the base of an embankment out of our view to the right. Uh, most of the fighting is to our right here. We're looking sort of northwest. But what it did was provide some protection from direct enemy fire, not plunging fire if there were any. Rockets and mortars continued to be uh, fired into the area by the enemy during this period of time. But this gives us a look at that, that area we actually see. Uh, a casualty being carried to one of the planes there. The name of that plane is Peg of My Heart. 
Uh, that may well be Purvis, Purvis's plane. I'm not sure about that. So this is the 6th of March. Uh, when that 90 minute, excuse me, 90 minute bombardment ended at 9:21 a.m., then the attack jumped off, and the Second Battalion, 23rd Marines, was applying the main effort for the Fourth Marine Division that morning. And Sergeant Wyckoff stood up, and and about all he got done that day was to say, "Let's go," and a grenade went off. And um, all he could taste was blood and gunpowder. And he said the pain was unbelievable. But let's, and this is a picture of him being carried through the CP, according to Sergeant Tom Gavigan, who's in front of us with a cigarette facing our direction. He said he mouthed to one of the guys, who is that? And he said, Wyckoff. Um, now, it's impressive because Wyckoff, the jump off doesn't begin until the bombardment stops and Jane can land. He is pulled back by Corporal Leroy Surface, treated initially, had an undershirt stuffed into a hole by a corpsman, Doc Bankin, carried back to the battalion aid station where they begin to move some shrapnel from his eyes, put on a hospital Jeep that happens to be there because of their location, driven back to the 4th Marine Division hospital where they remove more shrapnel from his eyes, assess him for flight evacuation, put him again on a Jeep and get him across to the evacuation center all in time for him to be one of the first casualties laid by the plane ready to go that morning. Now that's quick action. Impressive to me what they were accomplishing on the island. And Lieutenant Gil DeWitt, who happened to be on the plane with Jane, said, you know, when we landed, we inquired about Lieutenant Purvis, where is she? And they were told that her plane had missed the island. And therefore, by happenstance, Jane became the first flight nurse to land in a combat active combat zone, and DeWitt happened to be with her, and he was right in position to take this photograph. Now, I would point just a couple of other things out here. Um, you see the Marines in the background. Those are combat fatigue fellows, and <clears throat> sitting on some of those replacement stretchers, uh, we can see as well. But this uh, was also captured in color film footage, and if I plug this on my <clears throat> fledgling YouTube channel called Tan Side Out, um, I'm finished in the final stages of editing a video that includes this color footage and tells this story as well. I'll have that done in a few days once I get my act together. Um, but that's Bill on the left, Sergeant Wyckoff. And uh, in this video, I've got him actually describing some of his wounds um, and how he actually got cleared for flight evacuation. I don't really know, but he had a, a partially collapsed lung and severed left. He said the, the nerve was severed in his, his uh, left arm shrapnel in his eyes, et cetera. Uh, so uh, just a rough condition there. But he was stunned to hear the voice and feel the touch of a young woman. On He didn't know if he was still on Iwo Jima or not. Couldn't believe somebody was there. I put this photo in there just to make a point. Now, one of the fellows who's being evacuated, um, presumably with combat fatigue, that's Tom Melia. He's 18 years old and being comforted by a 22-year-old flight nurse on Iwo Jima. Um, it just sort of, <laughs> it's cold water to me uh, in the face and, uh, and and brings this to life. I mean, this, these are kids getting this stuff done for us out there in the worst place imaginable. A couple of photographs here taken on that flight that day back to Guam. So again, about a five hour uh, uh, scenario there. And what are they doing? They, she is going through the records that were waiting for them with each casualty and making sure that she's uh, giving them whatever treatment was prescribed for that and, and knows who to keep an eye on for hemorrhaging, especially for shock and things of that nature. Um, pilots would check to see who they have on board and what are the, what's the status. Sometimes they might not get above 1,500 feet in altitude um, to prevent excess bleeding or other issues of that nature. And on the right, Jane's actually talking to Bill Wyckoff there in that photograph by DeWitt. Um, she was a busy young woman putting meds together and even f preparing food for some of those, especially the walking wounded who were capable of eating fruit juices. They had boned turkey and chicken, tuna, soups, they had hot plates on the plane. Um, they could make sandwiches and soups and you name it. Uh, on board on the way to, to, to Guam. This photograph is one of a series that shows their arrival on that day back on Guam at Aganya Airfield, uh, just outside the evacuation 
center there on Guam. And we can see that the ambulances are waiting for them uh, and a bunch of other folks, including photographers. But Jane's on the scene, and that's uh, the medical officer uh, up in the plane kneeling down there to whom she's um, turning her patients over. And um, I like to point out that this is the first arrival on the 6th of March. Three other planes, they, the advanced echelon of the squadron had gone to Iwo Jima on the 3rd to set things up. And they had actually brought 12 casualties off the island that day. But this was the first day of full operations. And so those folks know that uh, there's as many as eight other planes, by my estimation, on the way behind them. They like to stagger the planes. By April, they were staggering them or trying to every 30 minutes to not overwhelm the teams on either island, especially this one. So they've got to unload this plane, get the ambulances moved, and, and uh, patients assigned to hospital as rapidly as possible because there's several more on the way, and they've got to keep going. Now, Jane uh, made several trips across the Pacific, uh, and as she did, she came back through Honolulu several times and became something of a sensation, because, largely because of DeWitt's photograph, I would point out. And this is one of her press release uh, or press conferences that she was part of uh, on Oahu, in fact, in Honolulu. And I would also point out, she's not just representing herself. Now, she did become, the, if I, if I use the term, the face of the flight nurse cadre in the whole squadron, but she, she's representing everybody. The other nurses, there's 12 initially out there, but she's also representing uh, folks like Chief Pharmacist Mate Sturdivant, Lieutenant Burns, the whole squadron. VE2 at that time. And if we were to move on to her entries for April 1945, one we can see she was she did go to Okinawa in April. She became the first flight nurse to land there on the 7th of April and made the news again. But then she was uh, uh, turned back toward the United States where she spent a couple of weeks, probably did the uh, press conference at that time and returned to the Pacific. So through April, May, and in June 1945, she went to uh, Okinawa six times. Now, I don't have my notes in front of me, but she crossed, she made the flight between Honolulu and Guam eight times um, during these few months that she was out there and made some additional runs between Guam and Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands uh, several times, moving casualties back and forth. A very, very busy schedule out there for her. Um, what they tried to do is uh, um, divide the, the workload between the nurses. So you had your first 12 nurses. They planned roughly for six planes to go each day to Iwo Jima or Okinawa. Um, and I would tell you this just as a, as a little tidbit. The plans for aerial evacuation from Iwo Jima were for uh, 350 casualties a week, approximately. Well, they did about half that every day. And uh, the number of planes sent were based on requests the day before, based on the casualties and based on the availability of shipping. And there were times during this period where uh, shipping was just not available. So this added evacuation um, capability made quite a difference. Uh, again, without the numbers right in front of me, I'm looking at the screen here, uh, they made 125 flights to Iwo Jima, the squadron did. Um, between the 6th of March, well, and, well, I guess the 3rd of March, and the 22nd, I think it was, of March, um, and evacuated, I think, 20, let's see, 2,393, I think was the number, casualties from Iwo Jima. Now, some 17,000, by the time they got started, some 17,000, almost 18,000 casualties were evacuated by ship. But what you've got... Uh, it, what we can see uh, by comparison is the hospital ships could hold about 600 casualties when they would arrive and take them a couple of days to go back and forth between Guam, for example, and Iwo Jima. Load up uh, in just barely a day and make that uh, real four-day evolution again. The squadron here could turn some real numbers in four days. So they made a tremendous difference uh, just in, in sheer terms of numbers. These photographs were taken of Jane uh, with the fellows on Okinawa. And you can just sort of catch a bit of the spirit there. Um, not just of Jane, but her colleagues as well, Mary Leahy and Jeannie Dahl and some of the other nurses as well, 
all had the same effect. But the fact of life is Jane had become a celebrity. <laughs> and all these Marines certainly knew who she was. Now, I mentioned a surprise. And uh, Jane never met when she went home after the war and had become something of a wartime celebrity, as many had, and went home and really didn't talk about it, like so many combat veterans, and uh, got married, married Bob Sheverton, one of the pilots who had been flying out there, and raised a family and, and started a life, and, and never met any of the Marines she had treated until 41 years later, when at the Iwo Jima reunion in San Diego, uh, they set it up and they sort of set her up and brought uh, Bill Wyckoff out there. Uh, Marines and a nurse from Camp Pendleton actually reenacted that scene under spotlight on the stage. And then they invited Jane to come up and the, the MC asked, have you ever met any of your Marines? And she said, no. And uh, they brought uh, Bill Wyckoff on, out on stage said, this is the Marine on the stretcher. So they were finally reunited there and uh, it was it was really quite a time. That's one of Jane's uh, snapshots there, personal snapshots of, of that event. So, uh, Ron, that uh, concludes this presentation there and, and um, very pleased. And I would say one more thing too. Now, Jane was Navy, Navy Reserve, but I'm gonna tell you, the Marines see her as their own. Uh, she's theirs <laughs> in their mind. So. Um, that's really what they refer to her as, as the angel of mercy. All right. Thank you, Steve, for your wonderful presentation. At this time, we will move into our Q&A for our at-home audience. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we will do our best to get to it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off with a question I had. Um, so you said that she was 22. Was that the average age of a flight nurse? I did a little homework on that last night. Uh, she was thus far the youngest one that I can see. She was two weeks away from her 23rd uh, birthday and, and, and another was 23 also. But uh, I mentioned Mary Leahy. She's 25. Uh, who, she's just she's one of the other nurses and their chief nurse, uh, their boss, Emily Purvis, was apparently also 25. So right in that neck of the woods, right in that area, uh, seems to be their age range. Uh, I'd also maybe put some of that in perspective. If you compare it to the Marines and the infantry units, uh, et cetera, the company commander of Fox Company, uh, Larry Snote was 23. Their battalion commander, Bob Davidson is 25. So, you know, and, and I would tell you in the, in the Marine Corps, in the infantry, those were the, those guys were called pop. <laughs> They're the old guys. So uh, these were kids out there. And here's a 22 year old, 23, 25 year old nurse. Now, the nurses said that, uh, you know, most of the casualties obviously are uh, enlisted men, enlisted personnel and, you know, kids. And they seem to take great joy in in uh, in saluting these ensigns, these flight nurses as and call them, sir. <laughs> and uh, saying yes sir no sir well, that's great uh okay we have a question from our at-home audience uh can you t elaborate a little bit on what things um were affected by altitude as a rookie maybe but um they if you had if they had head wounds uh, they say they would not significant head wounds they would not put them on a plane anything that might um uh, Intestinal wounds where pressure lowers and um, and unpleasant results could um, result. Uh, they just had to watch the, uh, you know, they weren't pressurized. So uh, if you change that pressure, that it, it seemed to uh, bring on some effects of bleeding and, and all sorts of other effects, including shock. So I can't really uh, give you a, a lecture on that, but those are the types of things that you see in the reports. Okay. Glenn. Yeah, I, it's funny because this ties into Masters of the Air where these B-17s and 24s flew at 25 and 35,000 feet and suffered dramatically due to the frostbite. Uh, happen to know from, again, some of my European knowledge of them flying injured back to England uh, and then England back to the States. They had to fly in unpressurized planes and they had to fly at 10,000 or less feet because of that feature, right? 
Um, and that that is a fascinating point is that these men were flying wounded in unpressurized planes, even at 10,000 or 8,000 feet. Um, in order That's right. And, you know, and the, you will see in the uh, some of the wartime stuff, the hospital quarterly, for example, uh, they say they rarely flew above 5,000 feet out here. The squadron did. And uh, uh, but there is an instance where uh, they said the pilot flew at 1,500 feet all the way back to Guam. Wow. So they did pay very close attention to who was on there. If you had if the, no sucking chest wounds, for example, were, were allowed on these aircraft. Um, in fact, chest wounds in general is uh, one of the one of the things that they uh, red flagged, even though um, Bill certainly had an open wound that had been stuffed uh, from some improvisation out there. But, you know, it's it's it is remarkable just on that point, if I can say in 10 seconds from the point of injury and then somebody dragging him out and Doc Bank and improvising, pulling the pack, pulling a shirt, an undershirt out of one of the Marines packs, stuffing a hole, dragging him back to the town and A station. They're doing what they can to stop bleeding, getting immediately to the division. This happens really rapidly. By four in the afternoon, Bill's in the hospital. He's in Fleet Hospital 111 on Guam. It's, it's impressive what they were getting done out there in the Pacific. Okay, we have a couple of other questions. One I think you kind of touched on, uh, which was elaborating a bit more on Bill's injuries. Mm. Uh, and another one is just want to give a shout out to Bill's family because it's ah, so they're, they're viewing. So hi. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, uh, I've got Bill's audio in the video where he is actually, while we're you know looking down on him, he's actually telling one of his fellow Marines later uh, all the wounds, the things that had happened to him. Um, but he said he was blind for several months, um, but he did get, regain his sight. He uh, had lost his hearing for a short time there on that uh, that day because of the blast. Um, had a couple of broken bones, one in the back of the neck, as I recall, uh, completely severed nerve in the left arm. Um, pretty brutal, uh, pretty brutal stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can you speak to how early in the war uh, nurses got to islands such as the Marianas from Honolulu, Honolulu post-combat? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that one. But I would tell you, as soon as the hospitals were moving out there, the, 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 the female nurses are certainly with them. Uh, not, you know, down in the South Pacific area uh, as well. Not going to be an expert on on that stuff, but um, you know, if I can think of the Fourth Marine Division, the, the hospital was so close to them on Maui, was in the little town of Makawao. That was an Army hospital that had moved there from uh, an area in the South Pacific, and uh, had had a very full and capable staff there, including uh, nurses. So they were uh, actively involved uh, from the start. But the flight nurse program was was new, and um, and you know they just got there just in time. It, it, from the wartime, from the periodic articles, it caught them by surprise that they hadn't even been in the Pacific a month, and here they are on Iwo Jima. They were surprised to be there that rapidly. Uh, now, w one of the other things that's astounding, and maybe this would emphasize that in some way, you know, the Marines and an Army division. Uh, secured, well, more than one army division, secured, secured Saipan, Tinian, and then you, then you secured in Guam as well. Um, that's June through August of 1944. I mean, those things aren't secured until August of 44. And here we are in February, really January, and the forward commander, the area commander reported 6,873, as I recall, available hospital beds on Saipan and Guam waiting for casualties from Iwo Jima. S almost 7,000 hospital beds in just, what, three months, a couple of four months? I mean, the construction had to be incredible to get this done. And you've got, they're not just building as their staffs with, with nurses and ambulances and corpsmen and everybody else that supports that. Uh, the tempo and, uh, is just incredible. Uh, we have another question that's come in. Uh, do you know if there were any nurses captured as POWs? 
Well, there were from the beginning of the war, uh, from the Philippines, as we know. <clears throat> some of them uh, rescued, some not, but some rescued, um, I guess, at uh, Cabaratuan, uh, that raid in the Philippines. And um, their stories, in fact, are pretty well highlighted in, in some of those books and some of those movies, as a matter of fact. They were very active, smuggling medications in and, and uh, doing some things that are nothing less than heroic. So from the early war, when the Japanese first uh, launched their attacks out there, yes, uh, those nurses that had already been out there were, ca were captured. Um, I'm not aware of any such things once uh, uh, the U.S. sort of joined an offensive phase. I want to say thank you to everybody who attended and thank you, of course, to our special guest today. Uh, before I let you go, I want to let you know that next month's webinar is entitled High Pocket High Pockets, the Claire Phillips story. So we'll be talking about her. Uh, thank you again for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day.